Howdy, today on Flipping Science, we're looking at electrophoresis, DNA profiles, and genetic information. One, gather your samples. Two, put some dye in those samples. Three, position the gel so the samples don't run the wrong way. Four, don't forget your buffer. Five, don't forget your ladder. Six, don't forget your control to connect that old gel to a power source. Thanks to Sam Moyle for producing this PowerPoint. So this is what we're going to cover. So uh, the sequence of DNA can be termed by electrophoresis. Electrophoresis can be displayed in an electropherogram. Uh, DNA sequencing enables mapping of a species' genomes. Um, we can construct DNA profiles from those. And DNA profiles can uh, identify the unique genetic makeup of individuals. So interpreting the electrophorograms, explain how differences in DNA fragments can be used in forensic science, and discuss eco ethical, economic, and cultural issues. So in 1985, Sir Alec Jeffries began the work that led to DNA fingerprinting. Um, in the region of the centromere, so that's the middle part of the chromosome, there are long blocks of uh, repetitive code called variable, number, tandem repeats, VNTRs, uh, or junk DNA. Um, it's not really junk, we're just not really sure what all the functions of the DNA are. The frequency of those um, VNTRs is characteristic, so different individuals have different numbers of these in different locations. We can use restriction enzymes, so restriction enzymes are molecular scissors, these cut DNA at specific sequences. We can amplify those cut bits uh, with PCR, and then we can analyze that using gel electrophoresis, which we'll talk about in a minute. This separates the DNA into uh, little bands, which is based on the length of the um, DNA section, and everybody has their own different um, banding pattern, and we can use that to solve crimes, for example. So we can use this in forensic science. So here we have a blood stain, for example. Um, everybody has an individual fingerprint um, banding pattern based on uh, the number of these variable number 10 repeats and their lengths. And you can compare that. So we can see that this blood stain matches up with uh, this sequence here. So how does electrophoresis work? So you've cut the DNA into different lengths of pieces. You chuck them into these wells at the uh, start of an agarose gel. So it's just like the agar we use when we're growing bacteria. It's uh, slightly different, but that's basically what it is. You chuck your samples in. Um, you run an electric charge through the gel. So at one end you have a positive end, and the other end you have a negative end. Uh, the DNA, sorry, I'll place it in the gel, so there we go. The DNA has different lengths, and the DNA itself is negatively charged once it's in solution. It's an acid, the acid loses the hydrogen ions, and it becomes negatively charged for the chemistry people out there. So because it's negatively charged, it'll go towards the positive end of the uh, gel. Bigger pieces of DNA have harder time making their way through the gel, so they don't go as far, whereas smaller pieces go further. So if we run, so there's our positive charge being applied, and we'll see that our large piece of DNA doesn't go as far, our smaller pieces of DNA go a lot further. Um, and this is how we separate out those pieces of DNA on an electrophoresis gel. Now this was the height of technology when I was going through high school, and now we have better technology that can work through this faster. So we have electrophorograms. Same idea, um, the difference is the end nucleotide of each piece of DNA is labelled with a fluorescent dye. So you have the sample that you're going to sample, it goes through an agar gel, but it's in a really thin capillary tube, and then the samples pass through a laser, and the laser can read off the fluorescent dye, and you have a different colour for each base. So as the uh, DNA passes through, the laser can pick up uh, what the base is, and then you get a nice big long sequence of ACTs and Gs. So VNTR has been replaced by short tandem repeats. So these are sections scattered throughout the genome, not just in that centromere area, uh, made up of repeated sequences of between two and eight nucleotides. So 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80 for example. That would be a two nucleotide base sequence that was repeated several times. This is much faster and it can be done automatically. So it's all done through lasers and computers these days, whereas back in my day it was people uh, look, taking gel electrophoresis um, slabs, taking photos of those and then um, analyzing them separately. You get two sets of chromosomes, one from mum and one from dad. The number of specific repeats is different, or well, could be the same, or it could be different between your mum and your dad. So you get uh, different numbers of these repeats depending on uh, if the chromosome comes from your mother or your father, or it might be the same. So let's say the uh, sequence TATC is repeated. Uh, let's say it's repeated 11 times at this locus. So this is a gene uh, location on chromosome 13. This sequence might be repeated 11 times on uh, that chromosome from your dad, but it might be 12 times from your mum. And we'd represent that as 11, 12. So the location of these STRs and the numbers of the repeats that are different between your father and mother or the same, um, this information can be put into tables and then from those tables we can make graphs. The more loci that you look at, the better you can compare between two individuals and you can compare the number of these uh, sequences repeats between individuals. So we make a graph in the table and I'll show you an example of this. 
So here's a graph. So here we are, our location here is D5S818, um, and we're having 11 repeats for, say, the father and 12 repeats for the mother. Here we have another, another location, we've got 9 repeats for the father, 13 for the mother, and so on. And you do this many, many times throughout the genome, you um, store an extraordinary amount of information in terms of similarities and differences between the mother's and father's chromosomes, and this will be unique for an individual, um, except for identical twins. Although identical twins will produce some mutations over their life, I'm not sure if that can be detected by this, but that'd be great. In a table, it might look like this. So here's the child. Uh, we can see there's 15 repeats on the X chromosome and 17.3 repeats on the Y chromosome. I'm not sure why there's a 0.3 there. This needs to match up with the father and the mother for paternity. So this 15 from the X, that matches up from the mother. And the father has 17.3 on his Y, so that matches up. So that means that this child is the child of the alleged father here. So this is the locus, this is the number of repeats on the chromosomes, and we can compare those to identify, in this case, the father of a child. This can obviously be used in forensics as well. There's a lot of ethics involved here. We can make new DNA sequences, and they could be harmful or dangerous, and this might be uh, leading to antibiotic resistance. We could be producing gene technologies that produce proteins that could cause a lot of harm. Um, and mutations could be introduced into gene pools in specific ways. There's the idea that designer babies could be produced using genetic technology. We could use the idea that uh, your genetic sequence could be recorded, and that could cause issues in terms of your civil liberties. There's this big question about life insurance companies, if they could get access to your genetic sequence, if they can determine that you're more likely to get a particular disease, then they could charge you more for your insurance. So DNA profiling uses STRs that are non-coding, but you could do it using coding DNA. And if you use the coding DNA, you could have a look at some physical characteristics. So, for example, if you look at genes that look at you know, nose length or eye color, eyebrow width, for example, if you could identify genes that shows those things off, if you get the DNA of somebody, you could make a copy of, in this example, a face. There's big ethical issues with this. You leave your DNA wherever you go. So somebody could make uh, copies of your body uh, using your DNA. There's also economic issues. It costs a lot of money to DNA sequence yourself. It could be beneficial, so having people's genomes might allow for more diseases to be identified or for more genes related to specific um, issues to be identified. But there's lots of issues with this. Um, who owns your genes? Do you own your genes or does society own your genes? Does a medical company that's analysed your genes own your genes? So there's a whole heap of issues in terms of ethics here that's fun to explore. So down in science, we looked at electrophoresis, we looked at electropherograms, we looked at DNA profiles, and we talked about ethical issues with genetics. That's it for the Science Day. Bye.